Thank you everyone for joining today. Um, today we're going to learn about how the brain controls motion by Dr. Dorita Chang, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Hong Kong. We're also joined by a simultaneous stream by her young Hong Kong University students. Thank you so much for lecturing Dr. Chang and whenever you're ready, feel free to start your presentation. Should be some awkward hour over there in the US. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. Um, I've got I've got um, a very complicated setup. I was telling my HP side students this. Hello. Um, Hello. Uh, um, and uh, so so feel free to type in, in Zoom chat on the IYNA side if you have questions. Um, and then on the HKU side, obviously in, um, in YouTube chat as well. Um, Justin over there on YouTube side, to turn up your volume. Can I give you another suggestion? Um, okay, so do let me know if there are, uh, there are problems. Um, okay, so, so this, is, um, this is actually a very interesting topic for, for me to teach. Um, um, in the context of sort of what I do, um, and um, I'm I'm gonna give you just a, a, a quick a quick introduction because th those are the instructions I guess. Uh, super small. I'm getting sorry. I'm getting some volume complaints over here. Can you guys hear me okay on on the other side on on Zoom? Yeah, we can hear you fine. Okay. Um, I'm just going to see if I can solve this. Okay. Um, so hopefully is that, is that better guys over there on, on YouTube? I just cranked up the, the gain. Better. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. All right. So, um, super awkward. So I am in um, Hong Kong. So here's a look. If for for those of you never 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 been here, um, this is the prettiest. Honestly, I've been here for a few years now, but this is the prettiest um, thing that we have on campus. <laughs> if anyone disagrees, let me know. Um, but so this this is the oldest oldest building that we have. It's on the old side of campus, but. But um, I'm actually housed in the uh, Department of Psychology. We're on the new side. You can see here um, with uh, these buildings looking significantly different um, in, in color. Um, HQ size students, you should recognize your centennial campus. So, so it looks, looks, looks quite, um, we have two, two chunks that are quite, quite different on campus. I'm housed in the Department of Psychology um, where um, I teach um, heavily in our neuroscience program now. It's actually a brand new program that uh, we launched four years ago um, to to um, start offering uh, major minor options in neuroscience for our undergraduates. It's actually not a graduate program. Um, and so in the context of this course then, um, um, we've been teaching, um, I've been teaching the, the, the core foundations neuroscience course uh, where I teach some of this content that I will, I will go over um, today. Um, but myself, in terms of my research, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because it's, it's irrelevant, but um, I spent most of my uh, time studying this part of the brain. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if any student here has any idea what the back of the brain there um, is responsible for. Which sense um, do I research? Vision. Very good, guys. So our uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube people are on a bit of a 10 second disadvantage. So uh, you're always gonna be beat by our Zoom folks. <laughs> um, vision, exactly, so that's the occipital lobe. That's where I, there's where I um, spend most of my time and I use like a, a variety of um, um, neuroscience oriented techniques. I'm interested in understanding the mechanisms of basic 
um, visual capacities, how we see color, how we see stereo, um, how we see motion, but more importantly, how in the adult brain we can use certain methods to reorganize the visual cortex, which, which is, to me, aside from the nerd nerd purpose of understanding you know the mechanistic basis of, of vision has of course a very obvious translational aspect asking well maybe one day we can use some of these basic vision um, lab-based techniques to to reorganize cortex in the visually impaired right to help them one day so i, I do considerable amount of mri research uh, we do um, some uh, brain stimulation research but today um, we're talking about the motor system and, and, and the motor system is, is interesting actually also for me because we're not going to talk about this today, but because of its very close relationship with the uh, vision system as well. Hello, TA Blossom. Good to meet you. Great. Everyone take notes. Oh, apparently your TA is taking notes. That's great. <laughs> But I'm gonna, this is my uh, roadmap for today. And um, one of the awkward things about today is um, in fact that um, I come here a little bit blind to what you guys um, know. I, my assumption is, or what, what I've learned is that you guys, I should be assuming a sort of a senior level uh, secondary, um, secondary knowledge. Um, and uh, obviously HKU side a, a first year a first year undergrad uh, type of knowledge and so um, I expect that for some of you um, there well for all of you there will be a lot of sort of new terms and uh, for some of you it will quickly become uh, overwhelming so I welcome you to let me know when I've lost you. This happens in my undergrad courses too because, because sometimes we assume uh, a lot of you guys. Um, so just stop me and uh, let me know what I need to break down for you and redo. Um, I, I don't have a lot of slides today, but I tend to elaborate a lot and tell a lot of stories. So, so feel free, again, if you're not comfortable talking, I don't know if it's set up so that you can speak, but go ahead and feel free and type um, on on both sides. So I plan to give you a walk down of the major components of the uh, central uh, motor system. Um, and I've sort of broken this down for you. Um, the gray matter stuff, which is, you know, everyone knows this gray matter cell body is what drives this um, gray matter stuff, the neurons, right? And it's most of what we think about when we look at the brain. Um, we think of the brain to be sort of this this different color from all the all the um, the the tracks, the axons. Um, and for those of you sort of new to neuroscience, right? Eventually, all our cells need to talk to each other. And um, and our axons, of course, you can think very very loosely to be those communication cables, although they don't quite at least not in the complex, complex mammalian brain. Obviously, these cables don't physically attach. At least they very rarely attach from neuron to neuron. But, but you can think of those cables as these white matter, white matter things that I have on these slides. And we'll talk a little bit about the role of these spinal tracks. Um, eventually, um, I will touch upon um, what I call the tiny stuff, which is what a lot of our students really hate, even on HQ side when I teach this, because we're really now talking about how the neurons once I reach the end of my cable, okay, how that signal gets transmitted to the next neuron. Okay, so we have a bunch of neurons lined up and we, uh, one neuron needs to transmit to the next neuron, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, the, what we're gonna learn is um, this NMJ, which I was a little bit too lazy to, um, to write on full. This is the neuromuscular junction. This is one of your learning objectives in, in, in your outline there. And that is just a fancy term for saying that interface uh, between uh, my motor neuron that's sending a command to, let's say, my muscle fiber, all right? Um, eventually, then, we'll touch upon some of these popular structures. You've heard about the cerebellum. Most people have heard cerebellum is important for, for uh, motor uh, commands. We're going to talk about uh, today um, just a little bit, actually. That's why I put it at the end about, about its role in uh, motor coordination. All right, so um, I'm going to start this lecture off um, by talking about chickens. <laughs> I've actually never started this lecture off by talking about chickens. Um, and um, I want to ask, in fact, I don't need to ask, I'm sure most of you have heard of this saying here, running around like a chicken with its head cut off. And I want to ask if anyone knows about the history of this very, very popular saying, and this very, very common saying 
uh, HKU side and, uh, and, and Zoom side, please press one in chat if you've definitely used or heard this saying before. Thanks guys, and we're gonna have a 10 second delay on YouTube side. Or maybe my HK students have never used this term. Definitely my lab has used this term because that's me every day. <laughs> Only Justin uses this term. Perfect. So the question is where does the saying come from? It's actually from a 14th, 15th century. It dates all the way back there. And, um, and what um, the, the butchers and the farmers at that time observed was that once they axed off the chicken's head, um, for whatever reason, the chicken could still keep running for a little bit. And um, in fact, in fact, there was a very, very popular chicken. And uh, this chicken, oops, I, I kind of overlapped, but if you can make out the text there, this chicken um, was called Miracle Mike. And you can actually Google Miracle Mike. This is actually Miracle Mike's picture. And the interesting thing about Miracle Mike was that he was actually, his head was butchered um, and um, it was considered a miracle chicken because he apparently survived for 18 months um, still kind of flapping and flocking about. The reason why I started my uh, lecture with a chicken is because what I want you to think about is what I want you to to get around in your head is that not everything is controlled by solely the brain, right? The, the the thing that is in your head. Because I think one of the unfortunate things about neuroscience, um, and one of the unfortunate things about teaching neuroscience in, in university is that a lot of the um, systems that we teach, we can teach while ignoring everything else except for the brain. And certainly I do that in one of my courses as well. And so that's what makes teaching the, the, the motor system very exciting because I'm trying to tell you here that certainly your brain as a human plays a large role in motor control and motor command. But there's another part of the central nervous system that is super important as well. And that second part is the spinal cord. Okay, and so the reason why, let's get back to this chicken for a bit so we can just take off this uh, photo. <laughs> I'll never come back to the chicken today, so don't worry. And, um, and, and, what I want to say is that the reason why the, the chicken could keep moving was because um, because its spinal cord is still intact and in at least the not so human uh, form of a mammal, okay, a lot of their motor uh, commands can be controlled from the brainstem down, okay? They don't necessarily need the, the more complex parts of the brain. And so um, this is sort of where I'm gonna start. And I'm gonna start with um, just, again, getting you to realize that um, there are two main sources of motor control that we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna, we're gonna talk about the spinal cord, um, um, which you can think about as um, really commands issued by the spinal cord are the commands that ultimately drive muscle contraction. Okay, well, if that's the case, okay, Dorita, what does the brain do? Okay, the brain, you can think of as more of like a master control center. Okay, so it has two functions. It will, A, it will um, preserve the kind of, it will take the, the, the spatial information that you have about your world, integrate it with sensory information, um, and it will help you motor plan. It will help you decide on a course of action. It will also help you, this is the brain, it will also help you decide on the way you're about to execute. Okay, if I want to, let's say, I, if I'm, I want to reach for my mug in front of me, how am I gonna go about that? And um, what are the muscles that need to be contracting and stretching in order for me to execute? But that's all that the brain does, okay? The spinal cord, okay, will take commands from the brain Okay, and issue their own signals to your muscles to eventually drive those contractions. So this is why I wanted to start with, with the chicken because I think the spinal cord gets neglected. And, and so this is, oops, sorry, not moving along yet, but I just kind of wanted to show you that. This is a figure taken, at, taken out of, actually out of one of our undergraduate um, textbooks. You can see here, this most, one of the most simple examples here, you've got a bunch of muscle fibers that you need to contract if I want to kind of do uh, this, this motion here. Um, and um, in order to contract, okay, you can see these kind of 
cylindrical columns are just cartoon representing um, um, kind of the, the microstructure of, of these fibers here. And each of these you can see are innervated, I'm gonna use this word innervated, by uh, specific neural connections that are coming from your spinal cord, okay? And so um, the, the point there is that ultimately, okay, your contractions are driven, the execution part is, is driven by the spinal cord itself, all right? And um, I am gonna show you here uh, um, another figure. Um, hopefully I haven't quite lost you yet because what I'm showing you is um, once I take the spinal cord and I give it a cut, um, a, a what we call a cross-sectional cut. So imagine, if you can see my video there, you guys on both sides. First of all, what I wanna say is, remember that your spinal cord is essentially an extension from the brainstem of your brain, right? And so I've got the brain kind of sitting atop here and then the spinal cord um, coming, coming all the way down here. What you're looking at in front there is a cross section. So if I take it on the side and I give it a chop like this, okay, then you're looking at kind of that cross sectional uh, content. And um, what I've written here um, are that those neurons that ultimately send those contraction commands to those muscle fibers are located on the ventral side, ventral side of your uh, spinal cord. So for those of you not so, not so good on neuroanatomy, dorsal, kind of your backside, okay, and uh, ventral side, your kind of your tummy side, okay, and that's, that's actually where, where these terminologies come from. So ventral side kind of on the, on the, on the bottom side. Um, and so neurons here then are the ones that are eventually um, sending out uh, commands through what we call the ventral root of the spinal nerves um, out towards your muscle fibers, okay? Um, I'm going to here um, further complicate it for you a little bit by showing you that, of course, you can see here there are also other roots on the dorsal side, okay? The question here is what are these doing? In fact, these are um, sensory fibers. These are sensory fibers. So just like we need to send motor commands out through our spinal cord, our spinal cord is also this nice interface for receiving data about um, where our limbs are and the current status of its you know, contraction state. Um, so it needs also proprioceptive and uh, um, sensory data coming back in um, to go back towards cortex, to go, up, go back towards the brain in order to give us sort of this, this feedback of, of you know, how my motor system is doing. Okay, and so these two then, we've got um, the, the ventral roots, which is what we care about today, but then we've got the dorsal roots over here. They will join up together um, to exit eventually uh, your spinal cord towards your peripheral limbs, right? So you can see that here. Um, it's very hard to sort of maybe um, understand um, what these are, but you guys probably have heard about your ver vertebrates, right? Your, your vertebral columns. Um, and you can see that um, you, you've got these kind of spinal, spinal fibers that exit above each of these um, sections here. I hope I'm not um, causing anyone to lose their lunch, but I think it's always uh, nice to have a look at uh, the real thing. I don't know if you guys have done bell ringers in your classes, but certainly studying off a cartoon figure is very different from studying off uh, a live um, specimen. But I wanted to show you here that um, very much like your cartoon figures, um, you can see that there are both dorsal and ventral um, fibers that are clearly um, leaving here from this spinal cord. And so it is visually uh, pretty accurate here, your, your, your cartoons. All right. Um, I'm going to move on. I'm not going to do too much on the spinal cord. I'm going to move on, but this is very important because, again, the spinal cord and the spinal fibers, the spinal nerves that exit um, um, your spinal cord are the ones that are, are, that, are, that are innervating and driving your muscle contraction. What I want to show you, of course, is that since your spinal cord comes all the way down from the, from the brainstem all, um, all the way to the, uh, your, your tailbone, that means then um, that we've got a bunch of um, um, different exit points. Um, that we can identify. And you've heard of maybe your 31 pairs of uh, spinal nerves, okay? And this is sort of what we're referring to here. We've got these, what we call uh, the cervical nerves, which doesn't, doesn't matter for your purpose. 
um, and thoracic nerves, um, lumbar nerves, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And each of these, I want to show you. You can see they kind of go off and innervate muscles of um, specific locations, right? So the first eight here, C1 to C8, are sort of your upper body to your kind of upper limbs um, innervation. Um, and then you've got, for example, you've got your leg ones um, down here. So it is sort of organized a little bit systematically in terms of the sort of where in the body that these spinal nerves are actually um, serving. All right, so um, hopefully, hopefully that is um, okay. Um, one of the interesting things um, about the importance of the spinal cord is of course, you've probably heard of people who have spinal cord damage. And um, these individuals, um, you've heard one of the biggest things um, is um, a, a form of paralysis, depending on where the lesion is along the spinal cord. And now just given what I have told you already in terms of, you know, you can have an intact brain, okay, but you're certainly, um, if you have an intact brain but you can't execute because that's what your spinal cord commands are doing. The final execution command is coming from a spinal cord. Okay, then, um, then that's that's the brain can't 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 overcome that. But one of the biggest things is, um, of course, research that is going towards trying to um, offer some solution to 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 um, fixing these motor deficits. And this is one of the videos that I, I like showing in my classes. I'm going to play this. I, I think I, I remember I I fixed the. Uh, the uh, the sound here, so both sides should be able to hear this. Um, just give me a second. Here. The objective of our research is to restore voluntary locomotion after severe lesion of the spinal cord. And in this study, what we have been able to achieve is restoring not only voluntary but even adaptive control of locomotion after a lesion of the spinal cord that normally induces complete and permanent paralysis. To transform the circuit below the injury from dormant to highly functional state, we administered a cocktail of pharmacological agents and applied electrical stimulation on the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. In order to achieve this goal, we developed this new robot that provides support against the direction of gravity but does not facilitate locomotion in the forward direction. This means that the rat can learn to walk over ground in a very safe environment. And what we observe is that over time, the animal regains the capacity to perform one, two steps, and then long run, and eventually, a paralyzed rat regains the capacity to sprint over ground, climb stairs, even pass obstacles. Mm. The brain establishes new connections. This means that the cut fibers, they regrow, establish relay connection in the spinal cord that enable to pass information from the brain past the injury in order to restore a voluntary control over the circuitry below the injury. The therapeutic impact of this type of intervention in humans is difficult to predict. But this very surprising plasticity and recovery that we have observed in the rat open promising perspective to improve function in human with spinal cord injury. And we are now investing all our efforts in order to move toward clinical application in a timely manner. Hopefully I've driven that message home about the importance of the spinal cord. We're going to come back to the spinal cord a little bit later um, and I'm going to introduce to you something a, a, a little bit different. Um, that is also very important though. But I'm going to move towards the brain. Um, and um, by the way, since I was talking about the chicken, um, does anyone know the answer to this? Do birds, which of course a chicken is, um, have the same brain complexity as a human? Yes or no? No. 
No. Okay, good answer. No is the correct answer. The question is, what is it missing? Um, it's actually missing the, the uh, very traditional six layer cortex that, that um, humans have. We're gonna come back to this um, in a second here, but we're, I'm gonna start with this because what I wanna show you, I, I don't think you can see this. This is my boyfriend, Joe. He's my boyfriend because he never talks back to me. But um, of course, what we're talking about in terms of cortex is sort of the surface layer of the brain um, that, um, that we're so obsessed about. But what I, what I wanna tell you guys, for those of you new to neuroscience, is that this surface, this cortex, is six layers thick. Um, but more importantly, it is evolutionary, um, rather new. And only rather kind of advanced species have the, the kind of benefits of, of this six layer cortex. Um, the complexity of, of the cortex, of course, also increases with um, um, evolutionary history. But birds don't have this um, traditional kind of cortex-like arrangement. Um, it does have your traditional brainstem. It might have structures that we might argue to be analogous to the human uh, cortex, but it certainly doesn't have the same amount of um, Certainly when we're talking about some of these regions today, um, I'm gonna insert regions under each of these, these uh, chunks here. Our chicken wouldn't have had those. Um, and so um, let's have a look at what, what the human cortex can do. Um, and I told you, in terms of execution, we already talked about um, the role of these spinal circuits, right? Um, so I told you also that um, at some point I need to make some overall decision of, um, of what I want to do. For example, grasp my uh, Starbucks, which is right in front of me and looking very appealing right now. And I'm going to throw a bunch of names at you and then show you, show you a, 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 in a few slides where they are. Don't get too overwhelmed. Like neuroanatomy is one of these things that will, it'll take time. And sometimes I forget the name of a particular structure myself if it's not a structure I, I, I deal with a lot of times, but I'll show you roughly where they are um, in a subsequent slide. But these are regions of the cortex, um, except for uh, this region here is actually some subcortical um, uh, structures that, that we'll talk about um, a little bit later today. Um, but we've got the prefrontal cortex, posterior parietal cortex, chickens not having the same brain as that of humans. Sorry, Jesse, I can take care of this one. Um, so, so, um, so the point here is that chickens don't have the same uh, six layer cortex that humans have. And a lot of our very advanced functions, not only motoric functions, but also cognitive functions, sensory functions, come from having that six layer cortex available to us. Um, so chickens don't benefit from that. Um, so, so, so we've got overall planning strategy, prefrontal cortex, post posterior parietal cortex. We've got then having to select and sequence um, how I'm going to achieve this overall arcing goal. And that's going to be more of what we think of the traditional motor cortex. No problem, Jesse. Um, the, uh, that's the, we're gonna call, uh, we're gonna have a look at the primary motor cortex, but also the premotor cortex. And then we're also gonna later on today, once you guys, are totally lost and exhausted. <laughs> we'll talk about the cerebellum and the basal ganglia. Um, and then finally, of course, we talked about execution and that's really the stuff that I was sort of beating into you because, because I think it's a very underappreciated part of our CNS, the brainstem and also the spinal cord, okay? So, so this is sort of how we think the overall hierarchy comes together. And we're gonna, we're gonna visit these parts. I know I started sort of at the bottom, um, but we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about um, what what the uh, other parts of the cortex uh, do for us. Now I'm gonna throw more terms at you, uh, <laughs> and um, I'm gonna show you here. It's a nice cartoon um, brain that uh, has labels, so I, I, I won't show you Joe this time. And the way you want to think about this brain. Um, is that this is the front, this is um, your eye side, and then this is the back of your brain, all right? And um, all, there are a lot of labels here, but one of the main landmarks that I use to figure out where primary motor cortex is, or where my motor stuff is on the brain, is I first look for what we call here the central sulcus, okay? And the central sulcus is exactly what it is, okay? So um, you've probably heard these terms, um, sulci and gyri, uh, maybe in your um, previous lectures before this one, right? So the sulci are those are those um, grooves, right? These kind of 
indentations and the gyri are kind of the well the not indentations <laughs> and um the the anyway the, the 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 reason why the central sulcus is important is because the motor area part of the cortex is located just in front of that okay i use the word anterior to that because anterior is you know in front right so um and you can see here i've circled area four area six okay area four and area six now first of all okay before I rant too much about area four and area six, you always hear these numbers, okay? I'm obsessed with vision, so we use V1, V2, V3, but you've heard of S1, S2 for somatosensory mechanisms. Maybe you've heard of A1, A2 for the auditory system, okay? Um, conveniently, we use um, M1, M2 for the motor cortex, but there's another labeling convention um, with quite a bit of history that uses um, these area number digits, okay? And there are 52 areas, um, and it was actually done by this guy who was on my very, very title slide. This guy here, Carbinian Broadman, who was a, uh, I think he was German, so a neurologist who, um, in the very infancy of neuroscience research, <clears throat> he decided to look at the histology, which means the, the structure, um, the gross structure of, of, the, um, of the tissue, and try to um, segregate them into 52 areas, well, into distinct areas based on both its cellular composition and its actually tissue morphology. And he came up with a total of 52 areas and he labeled them according um, to, to, um, to, these, to these histological differences. And so area four and six are these numbers that we use um, from these, we call them Broadman areas. So anyway, the point here is, we're gonna focus on these two areas of the cortex. There's area four here, which is highlighted in this figure in the like the pinkish red, okay? And that's what we call uh, today the primary motor cortex, okay? Um, and then there is this bluish area here um, that um, we call, uh, or Broadman labeled area six. Today, we like to call it the secondary motor cortex. Um, but it is unfortunately for students when we teach it, it is unfortunately functionally further divided into, you can see kind of this dash arrow here, into kind of this, what we call the lateral bit and the medial bit of, um, of, of the brain. Um, and so you can see here um, that not only are they functionally divided, and I will tell you how they're functionally divided in a second, um, but they're also given sort of different sub names Okay, so within area six alone, we've got what we call a PMA, premotor area, and we've got a supplementary motor area. So, oh my God, all these terms, okay, why do we care? Why do we care? This is why we care. Um, whoops, I don't know how, I don't actually have the labels right now. Oh, I do, I do have it further down. Okay, so I'm gonna show you a little bit further down again. Okay, but basically um, it has to do with this proximal and, and, and distal, uh, proximal and di distal serving. So let's stick to this slide for a second, um, but I will come back to a little bit more uh, complex explanation of, of how these divisions work. But for now, again, think of the patch we're concerned about in terms of the cortex, the gray matter stuff, okay, is everything that falls just anterior to the central sulcus line. Well, not everything, right? Because obviously not when we reach the frontal cortex. So if we take a look at first, the immediate part that we today call M1, okay? So just this red patch over here, okay? So um, I want to kind of show you, um, this is not, this is a bit of an oversimplification, but what I want to show you is M1, okay? much like the sensory patch. You see actually behind the central sulcus is another highlighted region here. It's actually conveniently the S1. And the reason why I like to kind of present them side by side, as you can see here, although one is serving a somatosensory function, so that is, for example, tactile uh, information, okay? And one is serving your motoric output, so that's the theme for today. But I want you to look at what we call this um, uh, homunculus, okay? This little guy, you might have seen this type of a, a figure before. And what it's actually showing you, okay, is that as we go, oops, as we outline around this patch of cortex, 
okay? You can see that there are certain regions that have dedicated parts of the limbs that they're serving, right? You can see here kind of this, this medial side, okay, um, to, um, to kind of the, the, the top here um, is actually from your kneecap onwards to your feet. Right, and as we're going over here, okay, um, towards a little bit more towards the lateral side now, we've got um, the hand patch of the cortex, okay? So quite simply, guys, um, although it is an oversimplification because there's a lot of overlap, so ultimately, if I wanted to send a motor command to move my hand, okay, it originates from the specific patch of M1 over here, okay? And let's say I wanted to move my mouth, okay? Um, and my face lips area, you can see is all the way down to this lateral side. What I'm going to suspect is a lot of you actually have no clue what you're looking at. And this figure relative to this figure. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna borrow Joe here for a second here. Okay, so again, what you're looking at here, okay, here's Joe. And what I'm gonna do, okay, is take a cut down Joe this way okay so it's basically again this coronal cut okay and I'm looking inside his brain from the back to the front okay so you're looking at again one of these coronal cross sections and so as I am showing you as we're looking from this side to all the way this side we're actually looking in from the midline of the individual towards the outer part so from the midline okay to the outer part of the brain, to the lateral side. So you see the midline part here is serving the kneecap and the feet, and then the very lateral side, um, kind of your mouth um, and, and um, well, the finer parts of your mouth. Okay, so then here's another question. Why on earth does this doll look so weird? Because we have a disproportionate representation, I'm gonna, accidentally give things away here. A disproportionate representation of the face. It looks so tremendously long here compared to, for example, the kneecap. Okay. And what I want you to think about is that not every part of your body is um, given the same amount of uh, treatment <laughs> in, your, in your brain. So some are disproportionately served by more neurons than others. Okay, and that's what this, this cartoon is sort of showing you. You can see your hands get disproportionately good dedication. I call it in my neuroscience classes, this is the concept of having dedicated real estate to the hand, dedicated real estate to the mouth and, and, and the lips area. But this, guys, is also the reason why we have such fine control of our hands and we have such fine control of how our face muscles move, okay? Um, it's, 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 it, in the end, it relates back to how much real estate we, we ask our brain to, um, to dedicate to serving those muscles, okay? And so the motor cortex has what we call this somatotopic organization, which is just this fancy term for saying it's got this kind of orderly organization for having this patch serves the knee, this patch serves the mouth, this pa mouth, this patch serves the hand kind of thing. This is the idea of somatotopy. And this, this kind of organization um, is preserved in other chunks of the brain that have different purposes as well, as I was sort of trying to hint at you. And that includes, for example, these sensory the sensory gyrus here. You can see the post-central gyrus, if we look at it, has very much uh, a somatotopic organization as well. So in that case, if you get some sensation at the kneecap, then that's this region here of the cortex that also gets correspondingly um, activated, okay? So that's area four. Okay, I'm gonna come back here now um, a little bit to this idea of what's contralateral. What's contralateral? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I didn't actually um, do all the text on my slide. So, um, so because, um, so the general story you have right now is that the brain sends commands to the spinal cord and the spinal cord sends commands to your muscles, right? This is where we are right now. What I haven't really told you, and I'm not gonna talk about extensively today, is that as at some point when your brain is sending commands down to, to the spinal cord, um, the, 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 the tract that this, this data travels along, these white matter tracts, it crosses over to the opposite side um, of your uh, brain. 
And so for that reason, like your right motor cortex ends up commanding your left side of your body and your left motor cortex ends up commanding your right side of the body. So that's, that's what this means. Uh, and one has a motor homunculus, so that I mean the motor um, somatotopy, um, uh, but that this motor homunculus controls the contralateral side. So uh, my right motor homunculus controls my left side and vice versa. Great, good. Nothing going on YouTube. I think YouTube side fell asleep, which is perfectly normal because a lot of them are my, my lab people and they tend to fall asleep in my lab meetings as well. Terrible people. <laughs> I'm going to come back to um, the six layer organization when we talked about the chicken and uh, well what the chicken doesn't have apparently and um, again don't overwhelm yourself but eventually the commands from my motor cortex as they are exiting to the spinal cord need to leave from somewhere and um, I was just going to show you that there is a very specific layer that it does leave out of and that's uh, it leaves out of layer five <laughs> Um, and that's sort of what this whole complex thing is just, I didn't have time to sort of white out every, <laughs> to, to, to like hide all the other terms. But the point of the slide is to show you that, you know, there's a specific layer that these, um, these axons leave to sign ups onto your, or to talk to your spinal cord, okay? And so you can see there, at least um, from layer five, <laughs> you two people, um, to, to the brainstem and the spinal cord here. and. Um, and um, um, it is noteworthy, um, although I'm not gonna beat upon it, but the, uh, the, the neurons that kind of make up this layer five are among some of the largest neurons that we actually find um, in, in, in the nervous system, okay? Now, if everyone isn't um, too overwhelmed yet, then um, we're gonna keep going on here and we're going to uh, talk about area six. So again, remember area four, and we talked about the little motor homunculus guy, right? With the somatotopic uh, representation. But then we also have another patch of cortex that matters as well, right? And um, that's area six over here, this whole blue highlight thing. And I said, it is functionally divided and it's kind of demarcated here to a lateral part, okay? Lateral part, the side part, and a more medial part, the kind of inner part. And the lateral part here is um, this, what we call the premotor area. And I'll get, bring you back those red line notes now. Um, and um, what I wrote here, um, the reason I say it's functionally divided is because this lateral PMA serves proximal motor units. Okay, more terms. Proximal motor units versus the SMA up here, the medial patch of area six, which serves distal motor units. It's very simple, guys. It's actually in the term, okay? Proximal motor units, all the things that are closer to the midline of your body. Distal motor units, all the, um, your limbs, your hands, okay? And so things that are farther from the midline. So my hand is a distal um, um, structure that needs to be commanded by a bunch of motor units. So distal motor units um, are actually controlled um, by my SMA. Okay, whereas the, the chunks, maybe uh, my shoulder bit, uh, which is closer to the midline of my body, proximal or to the midline of my body, um, is um, driven by this PMA part. Okay, and so that's, that's the main functional division between these two sub patches within this whole blue, blue highlighted area. All right, so. Area six then, together with area four, okay, um, then commands everything I just told you, right? Um, I think I had, I'm just gonna, so we don't actually have to go all the way back down here. I think at the very beginning, oops, where is my motor, motor cortex here? This, this slide over here. So remember again, area six, area four, all these things, okay, so confusing, but now you understand sort of where they are in the brain. But again, this idea of making an overarching goal and um, also having to um, select and sequence how I'm going to achieve these goals involves very much these two areas, all right? So if I come down here now, okay, if we're okay with areas four and six, there are more patches of the cortex that plays a role here. Just gonna fill in the gaps here. Um, and these are the regions that are more important about um, 
you know, sort of the planning of the motion. Okay, and um, and so these aren't your traditional sort of motor motor areas. Okay, because we talked about those. The area four and six are really your motor, and your premotor areas are really the prime areas we talk about when we think about the motor system. But like everything else, we integrate data from other chunks, right? So the posterior parietal cortex. Okay, you can see kind of highlighted over here in this purple bit, but also the prefrontal cortex over here. Okay, and um, you might have heard and at least most of you have heard about the functions of the prefrontal cortex at least, right? For the sort of um, decision-making processes, okay? For um, really evaluating what we call, um, a lot of the things that we call executive decision-making is done over here, right? Um, and so that's, it's no surprise to you that the motor system integrates stuff from your executive areas in the frontal lobe. And it should also be no surprise that your motor system also needs to integrate information from what we call the posterior parietal cortex because I think I said at some point, in order to plan my movement, I need to have data about where my limbs are currently located in space, right? Certainly me trying to grab my um, Starbucks mug over here is going to require a much different path um, from when I am currently sitting like this, then for example, when I am currently having a resting posture of having my, my arm, whatever reason, behind my head, okay? And so um, these spatial relationships, okay, and having to integrate all other um, kind of your sensory data from, from, from your, your other systems as well then becomes uh, also um, quite important, all right? Um, okay, so we still good. We still good on um, both sides. I'm very busy here because I'm staring at um, chat from both of you guys. <clears throat> now, what I want to do is give you an example um, of some of the research that goes into what we tell you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's very interesting. I'm sure this happens to you in your other classes too, right? Your prof just tells you the facts and you just have to take, take their word for it. Um, but of course, the facts we tell you have um, research behind it. I want to show you one of these cute studies. I'm going to focus on area six. Okay, again, for those of you, and I don't blame you for already forgetting where that is. Again, this blue chunk here. Jesse, we have an ex uh, we have a question over there. Um, can we approximate these cortex stuff as the functional areas of the cerebrum? They are certainly part of the functional areas of the cerebrum, but um, there are other functional parts, right? Functional just means serving a function, <laughs> quite, quite, quite frankly. So um, these, yes, but also um, everything highlighted here. There are undoubtedly you've probably read, you know, junk, junk, um, kind of casual articles that I've told you, actually they're not junk, that have told you that we, we don't use a significant proportion of our brain, that is true. Um, that includes the cortex, there are parts of the cortex don't, that don't really have dedicated functions to them. Um, and so if, if that's your question in terms of, you know, can we classify these as functional parts of the cortex? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. These are one of the, the some of the key, key functional uh, parts of your cortex. I forgot what I was saying. Um, oh. Area six, area six, and I was going to show you the data. Um, so yeah, area six, remember, okay, um, area six here, bring it back all the way to this slide here, motor and premotor cortex, these tactics of how I'm going to um, go and um, execute this, this action, okay? Um, and so how do I know, for example, that area six is specific to planning um, the tactics? and not specific to execution and not specific to the overarching executive um, um, planning and strategy making of your motor command. How do we know that area six specifically is in charge of how I'm gonna move my muscles to reach that mug, the tactics, the tactics. So I'm gonna bring you back to this monkey slide I wanted to talk about, which is a slide I, I teach in my 2101, guys. Um, and so um, this is called the ready, set, go task. So basically the monkey is trained um, to uh, press um, one of four buttons in front of them, um, depending on which one lights up. Okay, now imagine that what I'm actually doing um, as the monkey is performing this task is I'm actually recording from a specific area. I'm recording over this patch of six, area six, which again, I just taught you is 
specific for serving the function of um, tactic, tactic making. Okay, how, how I'm going to execute this reaching command. Um, and so what you're gonna look at here is um, the activity kind of in a schematic way of um, a PMA neuron, it's just a short form for an area six neuron. And the way to understand this is more firing of this area six neuron is represented by more of these vertical lines. Okay, so, um, so here what you're looking at is basically not a lot of firing, a lot of firing, and then kind of reduced firing. Now let me just give you some more context here. So in the ready, set, go paradigm, this is what's gonna happen. In the ready phase, the monkey has basically been given all the task instruction and knows you know, what to do given the rules. Okay? So it knows in terms of like executive wise, the rules of the game, right? But because this is at this point of my ready, set, go paradigm, all we've done to the monkey is, okay, there's, there are no lights on right now, okay? So the monkey right now shouldn't be engaging in its area six. Right, because it hasn't needed yet to make a decision about where to press. Therefore, it hasn't needed to make a decision about the tactics for how to press that button. Okay, and so under the ready situation, my PMA, my area six neurons, are totally not interested. And you can see that um, when we do some electrophysiology and we stab that. Okay, we don't really stab, but we uh, record. <laughs> record activity out of these PMA neurons and you see that they don't fire um, at all during the ready stage. Okay, well now let's see what happens during the set stage. At the set stage, the light comes on on one of these four chunks, okay? And when the light comes on, okay, now what's the monkey thinking? The monkey has decided, okay, where to press and it should have at this point decided how it's going to press it the tactic planning should have happened okay, um, at the set point. There's no execution yet because, the, um, um, because there's actually a trigger signal for the monkey um, that he must wait for before he must execute. But look at what happens here now to my area six neuron. You can see the firing increases quite a bit in this area six neuron, okay? And so this is sort of a sign of, okay, the light has come on, Okay, and the monkey has made his decision and also planned how he was gonna execute this motor command. This tactic selection has happened and that's why this PMA neuron is firing like crazy. Okay, then we have the go command. The go command, of course, at this point, we are beyond the rules of the game. We're beyond where to push and how to push it. We're saying spinal cord go, right? And so at this point then, you see once the trigger stimulus comes on and he's good to execute, you see that the PMA neuron again then reduces its activity, right? You can see how um, just by this task alone and the different aspects of this task, we can have a good um, idea um, as to what the PMA is actually interested in, which is in this kind of the set stage of, of uh, motor tactic planning. We all good? I don't see problems on either side. Okay, good. So at this point, the PMA neurons stop being interested. Great. All right. Now, guys, don't cry. Don't cry on me. If you've seen uh, YouTube Cry Style, definitely I've seen that in some of my other classes. <laughs> but here is where we are. We said so far, I'm gonna keep recapping for you so you don't get lost, okay? My cortex stuff, the gray matter stuff of the brain, okay, is responsible for understanding the rules of the game, but also eventually responsible for the planning and the tactics um, of how I was, I'm was i going to uh, issue that command. At some point, once I've done the tactics, I've gotta issue the go command. Let's go do it, buddy, right? And that go command travels down from the brain to the spinal cord, where the spinal cord then you saw those 31 divisions of the spinal cord have nerves that exit it to control these muscles to go execute command. What I want to go to for a second here um, to visit because um, this is actually going to come back to my chicken story. It's all about the chickens today. I hope we all eat chickens tonight. 
or maybe not. <laughs> um, is that I want you to think about as we are descending from the brain to the spinal cord this time. I'm gonna draw a picture and um, my HKU size students know that I can't draw, so I'm very sorry um, for you guys. I don't know if you can see this. Please tell me if you can see this, okay? as I'm going downwards here to the spinal cord. Um, I know my YouTube side can see this. I don't know if my Zoom side can see this. I've sort of given up. Okay, great. This is my best impression of a body. So you can imagine how the rest of my classes go usually. Um, so I meant to represent the brain here. It's obviously not circular, but let's, let's leave that alone for today, shall we? And we've got the spinal cord coming down. And then I said, eventually we've got these spinal nerves that need to exit to my muscle. Okay, I want to fix our terminology problem here. And in fact, I think HQU side will have this terminology, terminology problem as well. I want to make it all clear to you. The fibers that are exiting from the spinal column towards your muscles, okay, are called nerves, okay? I know it sounds trivial, but because I'm gonna be talking about tracks, I'm gonna be talking about tracks. Now I want you to think about why students get confused. <laughs> because both tracks and nerves are white matter highways, okay? That send signals down, okay? Um, but how we usually classify it in neuroscience is that we call nerves the ones that um, um, exist outside of the central nervous system. Okay, and so anything that is not encased in bone, this is how I te teach it um, so you can remember it. Um, it's not encased in bone because it exits out those spinal gaps, right, and uh, towards your muscles. Those are nerves, those are spinal nerves. What I wanna talk about now, and we talked about those way back in the beginning of this class. What I wanna talk about are the spinal tracts. So I'm talking about the stuff still inside your CNS and the stuff that is coming now from area four and six in your cortex to the spinal cord. Okay, so remember, I've got to come this way um, before I'm going to send commands outwards through the nerves. Okay, those are tracks. Okay, these are spinal tracks. So I'm talking about between the brain and uh, going to the spinal cord at this point. Okay, and what I want to tell you is that there are actually two main categories of tracks that we need to care about. Okay. Um, as we're going from area four and six to the spinal cord, okay? The first category, okay, are what we call the lateral pathways, okay? And um, the lateral pathways are usually what we think about, actually. If, if you're a motor system person, you almost exclusively care about this because these are the ones that really come from the cortex itself, okay? Um, and these ones control dominantly, at least in the human, um, any of your voluntary uh, movements, okay? Um, and we have a second category of pathways, okay? These ones you see in my red line notes are brainstem controlled uh, pathways. So in fact, they don't quite originate up in, you know, those, the, the gray matter area four and six on the surface there, but they originate a little bit further down. I'm going to get rid of, sorry, I'm going to get rid of that um, because that was very distracting there. Um, because I, I need to show you this picture um, for those of you who, you know, neuroanatomy problems, right? Uh, <laughs> so again, assume area four and six somewhere on the surface here, right? Okay, and so we've got our main category of signals traveling down through our, our lateral pathways, but we've also got secondary tracks, okay, um, that um, originate from the brainstem itself. And the brainstem here is further down, okay, um, you can see midbrain pons medulla, okay, that's your brainstem here, quite deep um, into your brain. These ones are in charge of, um, you know, things like posture and um, some of your uh, reflexes as well, okay? So for us today, and really it, um, to prevent you from getting totally overwhelmed, let's focus on the lateral tracks uh, because, uh, because I need to get back to my chicken story, right? And uh, the lateral tracks here, okay, 
Um, I, if you just look over here, it's just showing you again if we took a cut through the uh, spinal cord and just have a look at where they travel. And that's why that's why this, this kind of rather crappy figure is not that informative. But you can see here there are two clusters of tracks here. There's one, this rather fat one here. Um, called the corticospinal tract and then there's kind of a smaller um, in diameter cluster of fibers called the rubrospinal tract. Um, and what I'm going to tell you is that, um, well we can actually find out. What I'm going to tell you is both of these lateral tracts more or less serve the same function, okay, which is direct this voluntary control of movement from the brain, okay? So the question is, why do we have both of them? And what I'm gonna say is that um, it seems to be an evolutionary story here. It seems to be that we first evolved, like other non-complex, that's, that's subjective, but not as complex species, for example, like the chicken, we may have first observed a rubrospinal control from the brain, okay? And it was only much later as humans developed this complexity of having a six layer cort contact, uh, cor uh, cortex, um, having the luxury of, of having, having this cortex, that then we later developed this um, lateral, uh, this, this corticospinal uh, part of the tract, okay? And the reason we think um, that it has an evolutionary reason for existing is um, based on from from what we see uh, from lesion data. So have a look here um, in my text. Unfortunately, I, I, I seldom like to do this, but it's all text this slide. Let's say we cut both available tracks that serve voluntary movement control. So I'm going to lesion both the corticospinal and the rubrospinal tract. Okay. What we're going to have, not surprisingly, okay, is that we're going to have fine postural control and fine reflexes. Why do we have fine posture and fine reflexes? Because I told you that that's not served by the lateral pathways, right? That's served by the ventral media pathways that we're not gonna care about today, okay? Um, we're gonna have quite a bit of deficit in, in um, having an independent control of, of, of um, you know, different fingers, different muscles um, because of these lesions. But what I wanna say is look what happens if we lesion only the corticospinal tract, okay? I lesion only corticospinal tract, I still have one more lateral pathway, the rubrospinal tract, right? And what we're gonna have initially in such a patient is that they will have deficits that are very similar initially to the above here, but you will see an eventual recovery of motor function, okay? The point here is that eventually what we see is that the rubrospinal tract can actually take over function from um, the, the cortospinal, corticospinal tract as well, okay? And so what we have in the human in terms of the lateral pathway, so again, the tract that is connecting the brain and then sending to the spinal cord before we send out to the muscles, right? Um, what we have is a little bit of a very nice redundancy, okay? That is evolutionarily built in, okay? And of course, what the chicken doesn't have is um, very much um, going to be this, this type of luxury because it doesn't lack the same, um, it, sorry, it doesn't have the same complexity as us up in, up in cortex, all right? Okay, good. How are we doing over here? Checking, checking in, checking in to everybody. Still alive apparently for now. Good. A little bit difficult, right? But I think maybe not. It, like even if you get lost in the terms, the premise is still the same, okay? Gray matter stuff, the cortex, okay? The planning, the decision making, and then down to the tactic making, okay? But eventually the execution, okay, needs to come down to um, the spinal cord, right? My cortex needs to send information to my spinal cord via these spinal tracks, tracks, okay? For my spinal nerves now to go talk to my peripheral muscles, okay? That's what I spend an hour talking about, honestly, and chickens, all right? All right, now, one of your other learning objectives was the uh, this tiny stuff here, your neuromuscular junction. So now, here's what we're thinking. Eventually, okay, 
as I'm exiting my spinal cord through my nerves. The size of the both track doesn't, we have a good question, Jesse. So the size of the both tracks doesn't really play any role in maybe one having a higher function than the other right. Um, I think, so, so the sizes of the tracks, more broadly speaking, um, not just the motor system, has an implication for the speed of transmission. Um, so what do you think? Uh, a fatter diameter um, tract is going to transmit faster or a smaller diameter tract? Um, this is a little bit of a difficult question, actually. Just take a wild guess. This is, I, I don't know if I have any, I do have some 2101 students here. Yeah, exactly. A larger one is gonna transmit faster, good. And for those of you who can't quite your head, get your head around this, we don't need to get into the details. But the way I like to teach this is, think about like small wires as having greater resistance than big ones. Cause you got, you're a little bit more spacious, right? So your ions, okay, try not to talk about ions today, but signals travel faster. <laughs> <laughs> the larger one, yeah. So, so not just the motor system, but um, across all your all your sensory systems as well. The fatter one will be will 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 give you more reliable and faster transmission. In that sense, then Jesse, um, I wouldn't say it has a higher function, but it certainly gives us a better uh, reliable uh, transmission. Um, small stuff. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, so signal, signal. Oh my God, I have a uh, writing problem. When the signal is traveling, oh no, I don't. When the signal traveling down the spinal tract eventually reaches the muscle, it needs to talk to the muscle. Okay, so this is going to garner a lot of hate on HKU side. They really hate to talk about synapses. Um, and I'm gonna try to just, you know, I'm gonna try to make this easy for you. I don't know if it's even entirely possible. I don't know, again, because I didn't pay attention to the schedule. I'm not sure if you've already had a thing on synapses in your lecture series. Um, but I've got a very complex picture for telling you that eventually my motor neuron that is sending a signal out to my muscle needs to talk to my muscle cell. Contract, muscle. <laughs> and when we talk in neuroscience language, it's called synaptic transmission <laughs> synaptic transmission so we call this a synapse right basically um event uh, just just a bunch of pictures on, on 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 how a synapse might look like kind of ta kayla sorry to step backwards didn't quite get why a more complex cortex mean we should benefit from another pathway talking yes no problem um we benefit in the sense that we have um, a fail safe. Um, we benefit in the sense, like, like, like we just talked about, we benefit in the sense that we also get probably a faster and more reliable transmission um, in that sense. But we also benefit, and what, it, what I really meant by benefit in that context was because um, then we benefit from more finely controlled um, motor commands uh, because we, we um, what I didn't actually tell you is that out of these two lateral tracks, um, that one of them truly originate from areas forensics, and the other one actually doesn't quite. The other one actually origi origi originates from the midbrain. So it's not as privy. It like it 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 does eventually get data from from forensics and other cortical areas, but indirectly. So you can think of um, if we want to just take it back to the chicken example. Um, I think more simply put is that um, the, the chicken doesn't benefit from the additional executive elements that humans benefit um, from uh, given these additional corticospinal tracts. Um, great. Oh, synapses. Yeah, okay. Guys, and we're not gonna to do too much of the synapses, although I do have like, you know, a number of figures on these. Eventually there are actually some more cool stuff I wanna talk about. So, um, and I'm starting to um, take a little bit longer than I thought. Um, but the first question is, first of all, we talked about how 
those white matter tracts, whether we're talking about the spinal tract between the brain and, and going to the spinal cord or white matter tracts exiting the spinal cord to my muscles, okay, there are signals that are going down these information highways. What you're lacking, and I'm not sure actually um, if, if you have had a lecture on, on something that covered this, um, is what are the actual signals that are traveling down these information highways? Um, and and I, like again, I don't want to go into too much about this because it, it's removed from. This isn't a basic, you know, sensory transmission or, or or signal transmission part of neuroscience class. So I don't want to do too much of it. But you do need to know, okay, that um, eventually this stuff is being carried by proteins, right? What you've probably heard, neurotransmitters, right? And um, what I want to show you here um, is just some pictures and some just general logic. Sorry about that, everything just crashed. And actually, I don't quite remember where, like where I was before we lost everything. <laughs> um, synapses, probably this slide here. I think we had a question though. Um, humans have a six layer cortex. What does six layer mean? Uh, Navina, did you get that? And that thing answered um, yeah basically you see this this surface of um, of, of this this Joe here um, I'm trying to see if I can hold it up to the camera um, and you see the you know in fact what you're looking at um, it, it feels like only sort of one layer of gray matter but in fact there are six layers okay of, of cortex and I think you can't really see this because he's not exactly gray on the outside but um, if you were to if you were to sort of slice cross-sectionally then you would actually see six layers of it, of, of that gray matter um, and each layer although again beyond the scope of today each layer will have its own uh, specific um, usually very specific subset of neuron types that do specific things. So for example, in these sensory systems, layer four likes to receive things. Um, um, okay, back to NMJ. Okay, um, right. So basically, um, where everything is, uh, yeah, sorry about that, guys. I, like, I honestly had to reboot <laughs> and come back on because um, because everything was just crashing up. Um, so Right, so the interface where the, the, the motor neuron is talking to your muscle, um, and that's all you have to think about in terms of what that fancy term refers to. But what I wanna say is that the NMJ is historically very important because um, it was uh, one of the, uh, the key interfaces that uh, neuroscientists studied, studied to try to understand just general mechanisms for how uh, neurons uh, spoke to each other. Um, and so, um, so again, have a look here um, at this figure. Eventually, my nerve coming out of the spinal cord needs to synapse on to my muscle cell, okay, in order for it um, to to talk to talk to the, the 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 fiber in order to contract. All right. So, again. Um, don't be too worried if there are like too many terms here, but I just want to give you kind of an overflow about how, like I mentioned, the problem, the first question I had for you was what actually are these signals? And I said, these signals actually proteins that are, we carry, these proteins called neurotransmitters that are like sort of carrying data down um, and between cell to cell. Um, and in general, okay, you guys actually might've learned this already in some of your secondary work, but in general, um, we kind of go through these stages, right? We have a synthesis part inside the cell, okay, that um, uh, needs to, um, you know, you've probably heard of these terms, the DNA and the RNA, right? And these RNA chunks need to be replicated, okay? They get sent outside your, your, your cell nucleus, and at some point you need to be able to have protein synthesis based on this kind of, these RNA, DNA instructions. Eventually, okay, um, all these neurotransmitters um, and any other proteins actually gets, um, gets uh, packaged down and sent 
to their respective locations. In the case of neurotransmitters, okay, very often they will get sent to the end of the uh, end of your uh, your axonal terminal. Okay, you guys are familiar with those terms, right? Like I, I think I don't need to go over those, right? The um, cell bodies and the axons and the axon terminals. You guys should be pretty okay with those, right? But eventually, the core of having a cell to cell talk talk uh, speaking to each other is the the release of these neurotransmitters onto sort of a little synaptic gap and then the uptake of these little proteins these little uh, neurotransmitters on your second cell so cell one and cell one over here and cell two over here right and so um, the, the NMJ specifically will have its own specific neurotransmitters um, that are working here. And so um, I'm just going to add a lot of red line notes here for you um, to kind of turn this very generic textbook figure into an NMJ synapse. Okay, again, the synapse is that interface where we have cell talking to cell. Okay, so whether it is we have our spinal cord, uh, uh, nerve cell talking to our uh, muscle fiber cell okay let's take this as an example okay what's happening here so we've got our spinal cord presynaptic nerve cell here okay um, trying to talk to our muscle fiber down over here okay and so you've probably learned the principles of um, how a uh, um, kind of how electrical transmission works right so we're gonna have a action potential that is going to arrive okay in your first cell and that's going to trigger the release of these protein packages acetylcholine these are your neurotransmitters over here okay I'm gonna give me a second to, to, to jot that down for um, oops sorry um, there we go stop pressing buttons there we go acetylcholine <laughs> are your neurotransmitters here that's happening at the NMJ Remember that my second cell, which is going to be my muscle fiber here, needs to uptake these signal packages, these neurotransmitters, right? Um, in order um, for that signal to be transmitted, okay? And that's going to take the form of these acetylcholine ACH receptors, okay? And so these ACH receptors are going to bind um, these acetylcholine packages Okay. And as they bind these acetylcholine packages, okay, again, not sure if you learned this, again, do ask if, if you're totally lost, but the binding is going to trigger okay, a, a change in the overall uh, potential, overall uh, um, positivity, let's say, of, of the second cell. And um, that's gonna cause final consequence here Okay, the change in the internal um, positivity of the voltage okay, inside that second cell, quite simply speaking, okay, will drive calcium release, which then trickle, triggers muscle contraction. That's sort of as simple as I could make it for you today. <laughs> but for those of you who don't even care about the names and don't even care about what is happening here, all you're thinking about is this. Okay, this signal information is being carried by these protein packages okay and at some point these protein packages need to make it from cell one to cell two okay my nerve cell fiber coming out of my uh coming out of my spinal cord to my muscle fiber in order for me to contract um in order to do so okay um Specifically, the NMJ will have its very specific names for its neurotransmitters and very specific receptors on the fiber side. Okay, but it is the rebinding, or it is this this kind of transmission of these uh, neurotransmitter packages that will lead to a net change in the internal electric potential of of your second cell, right? And that is itself is going to change. Um, uh, or is, is going to trigger a uh, calcium release, which then is going to trigger uh, muscle contraction. Believe me, this slide was a lot more complicated, <laughs> um, but this is this is sort of as simple as as the, as as the explanation as I could make it. Okay, so again, you know, hopefully that doesn't um, 
you know, it doesn't overwhelm you too much, but like this is the NMJ. It's just a very specific synaptic junction referring to the motor uh, junction here um, between the spinal nerve cell and, and the muscle fiber. And we're involving very specific neurotransmitters here, uh, acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors, and then calcium in order to trigger, trigger the uh, muscle contraction. Okay, but it works if you study synapses um, under any other context in the nervous system, it works the same way. Okay, it works the same way. All right, good, great. All right, now, I actually think this is more fun, but it, it's actually not any more easy. So I'm gonna conclude with a little thing about a structure that you might not think matters, but it matters a lot. And I wanna give you a different perspective in terms of how you think you initiate movement. Okay, because everyone thinks we initiate movement by we're gonna excite, you know, the cortex, then we're going to excite the spinal cord, and then we're going to excite, you know, the uh, nerve cell, and uh, we're gonna do another excitation to tell a uh, um, uh, muscle to move. Okay, the story is actually not quite like this, all right? And so we've got some other problems um, under, within, like uh, under under different contexts here that I'm going to introduce these structures um, here the 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 basal ganglia and uh, the cerebellum here so here's the here's the premise here so we now now know how movements are planned and executed cortex spinal cord okay but there are some missing pieces okay again I'm again I, I feel like I'm a little bit overwhelming you with these anatomical um, labels but but again don't don't be too worried because I'm going to go over the general gist of why we care about the basal ganglia. Okay, the basal ganglia is not cortex. Okay, it's not quite cortex, but it's it's sub it's set it's a set of subcortical nuclei, and um, I think we had a question again about the sixth layer cortex. If we look very carefully, if you have dissected a brain, okay, which we actually do in our first uh, first uh, foundations course here, what you will see. Okay, is that you will see kind of this pinkish area, which is actually what we call the gray matter. This is the cortex around the outer side. Um, and then you will see that contrasted with what looks like a lot of fatty tissue. That's your white matter stuff. Those are all the axons that we're talking about. Okay. And when I was talking about the six layers and I kept talking about it, although this looks like to you from the naked eye, a single layer, in fact, there are six layers here going down okay and so that's what I kept talking about there the point here is the basal ganglia are all these things in the green all right and these all these nuclei in the green collectively okay matter quite a bit when we're talking about um, initiating action and I'm gonna try to work with the story um, here without totally losing you or myself um, from a technical standpoint here <laughs> Okay, so we've got something called the striatum. Doesn't matter if you don't remember it, but they're labeled here. Okay, we've got something called the globus pallidus, which is a little bit um, kind of inferior here, a little bit deeper. Okay, these two chunks labeled here. And then we've got something called the substantia nigra, even deeper over here. All these are, you know, subtle nuclei that make up uh, uh, this, this cluster of thing called the uh, basal ganglia. And again, it's subcortical because it is not a part of cortex. It's subcortex, okay? That's what we mean by subcortical. Now, the biggest thing what we're going to learn is one of these nuclei constitutes a major source of output to the thalamus. And it occurs to me, of course, that most of you don't know what the thalamus is, okay? But it's a very key region of um, the brain. Again, it's a subcortical region that likes to feed back up to cortex, okay? So if you wanna think about why we care at the moment for the basal ganglia, you can think about these cluster of nuclei as um, constituting a part of a feedback loop towards cortex, okay? Um, to um, constantly update and, and um, initiate uh, movement and tell the cortex, okay, we need to stop, we need to inhibit, we need to stop movement, stop stretching, stop contracting this fiber okay so we need something that goes back up to cortex and the basal ganglia 
um, plays a very large role in this. Specifically, the Globus Pallidus um, plays a large role in this as well. Just more cartoons. I'm actually um, going to probably skip this so you don't so you don't get too overwhelmed. But since you're recording it, you can come back. But I wanted to give you a cartoon for like how these green spots correspond to sort of how you might look at it from um, a, a, a lateral a lateral perspective. But I'm going to skip over this um, at this time. This is the point I was just making here, and it's, it needs to be absolutely clear because then I'm going to show you a um, animated GIF that um, is basically the highlight of this lecture if the chickens weren't. Okay. Uh, so again, the basal ganglia okay, receives extensive output itself from the cortex, but it also feeds back into cortex. And I kind of write that all down for you here in the corner. Um, so the cortex in particular, those executive and the kind of decision-making regions and the spatial regions here feed into the basal ganglia, which then feeds into the thalamus, which feeds back to cortex to, you know, to keep it online in terms of giving it a current status of do I keep stretching, do I not, do, should I inhibit um, and stop stretching my muscles. Um, and so the, the flow is something like this. Okay, and what I want to say, um, so I've just put a little note here. Usually what we're feeding back up to is, is area six, which we talked about um, uh, a little bit earlier. What I want to talk about is why we care so much about the basal ganglia and specifically the substructure of the basal ganglia called the globus pallidus is because of its role as a motion gatekeeper. Okay, a motion gatekeeper. And um, you can see in my uh, little notes that I've written down here, okay, what it actually does as um, a structure is it by default keeps our motor programs and motor actions turned off, okay? If you think of yourself, I'm gonna bring the GIF on now and I'm gonna come back to this slide, okay? If you think of yourself as if I had no GP, if I had no globus pallidus, okay? I would be doing something like this, okay? So you natively want to turn on your motor, motoric actions, but you are tonically inhibited because of the existence of your globus pallidus. That means in order for you to move, you need to release actions from their inhibition. Okay, so I'm gonna say this one more time you are by default wanting to be like that animated GIF. But because of your basal ganglia and how it loops with your thalamus and back to your cortex, you by default keep a pretty good handle on your motoric programs by keeping them turned off, by keeping them inhibited. By extension, then the way you actually want to understand motoric execution is we do it by releasing the action from its inhibition. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so my O1 students should have already learned this. Okay, and that's why the GP, the globus pallidus of the basal ganglia, is called a gatekeeper. Okay, because you can see here it provides tonic inhibition to the thalamus, holding back the, the flow of possible responses. And when I want to move, okay, what we're going to do. Okay, if all these were all possible responses and my basal ganglia keeps them all inhibited, then that means when I want to do something, I need to disinhibit one of these canals. So selectively removing tonic inhibition releases one particular response, okay? And this disinhibition then occurs via um, this striatum to globus pallidus type of connection, okay? So hopefully that is plenty clear. It's very, very important um, aspect of uh, the motor system um, that, that you do need to uh, keep in mind. I think I have eventually, like I do have one slide, I think you guys should have it as well, that kind of writes this out. Um, and it's, it's not that complex at all if you have understood what I just said in, in words, okay? So again, okay, all motor actions are inhibited by default. Okay. Selection and initiation of a particular action then involves disinhibiting the corresponding thalamic neurons. Okay. So again, at rest, okay, the globus pallidus ex exerting tonic inhibition on the thalamus, 
holding back all your flailing around. And when you want to action select and action execute, okay, you are inhibiting, okay, this glob globus pallidus, which then disinhibits the thalamus in order for you to act. Okay, so this isn't something I expect you to remember now or really have a very good handle on, but the premise is you need to disinhibit the inhibition in order for your motor program to proceed. And that's how we act, okay? It's not just about turning things on, okay? In this case, in our motor system, we work a little bit backwards. It's about turning off the inhibition, okay, in order to move. Okay, and I think that's one of the uh, cool things actually about um, the, the, the motor system, all right? Okay, I'm going to skip this as well because it's, it's, um, it's actually more of the same. Um, but I want to now give you two food for thoughts. Uh, I'm nearing, like I think I really will finish on time, so don't worry. <laughs> but I wanna talk about two very, very common um, uh, diseases. One is uh, neurodegenerative, one is also um, genetics related, and you guys will definitely have heard of it. Um, Parkinson's and, um, and uh, Huntington's disease and how they relate and why I taught you about the basal ganglia and about this disinhibiting the inhibition thing in order to move because now you are totally equipped to understand what is happening in Parkinson's and in Huntington's. We're just gonna give you a slice of the of the basal ganglia here. Again, um, this is a, another structure here. This is not the globus pallidus, but this is another subnucleus um, that was highlighted a few slides ago. This is the substantia nigra. And the substantia nigra, um, actually, if you see here, actually, um, you can see it's kind of darkish in color, and that's because it um, contains uh, quite a high level of the pigment melanin. Um, the point here is that the substantia nigra contains uh, a particular subtype of neurons that produces another type of protein, dopamine. Okay, And um, dopamine is critical for your motor system um, because when we were talking about releasing actions from their inhibition, dopamine is key to doing this. Okay, Dopamine is key to disinhibiting the inhibition. Uh, of your thalamus on your motor programs, okay? So that by extension means if I had a lack of dopamine, okay, then I should have a lack of motor control. All right, we still all good. Or I've, some of you guys are already asleep, not entirely sure. Which brings me to the first of the two I wanna talk about. And then I'm going to uh, give you one slide on the cerebellum and send you all the way. Parkinson's. I usually, when I'm in class, ask my students what they think the most characteristic uh, symptom of Parkinson's is. And what I hear usually is the, uh, the tremors, right? Indeed, I, I do understand why, um, why um, you know, that, that is probably the most salient thing that you see of a Parkinson's patient, these kind of almost like repetitive actions. It is a mini tremor that you see. Um, but I think the tremor gives you a false understanding of what is actually happening here. Parkinson's is not defined by excessive movement, okay? That is not why they are um, tremoring. What's actually happening there? Parkinson's is primarily characterized by what we call here hypokinesia, okay? This is a, a paucity of um, movement, which means basically a um, lack of um, lack or rigid or just not not good um, movement, slowness of movement, rigid movement, okay? And given what I just told you between, uh, about the relationship of just now, one of the nuclei of the basal ganglia, okay, the substantia nigra, it being dopamine producing, right? Which now we understand to be those key protein packages, key neurotransmitter packages that drive the disinhibition of action or action inhibition. <laughs> um, given that we know this, okay, now look at this picture that I have in front of you and look at the SN of a diseased brain, a Parkinson's brain versus an SN of a totally normal brain, okay? And what you see here obviously is much reduced black 
pigment, right? And in fact, we have a degeneration of these dopamine generating neurons in a Parkinson's substantia nigra, okay? Which means, okay, it becomes very difficult to initiate and sustain motor actions, okay? It becomes, remember this, this whole thing, I kind of zipped around here, okay? Dopamine is key to driving this di disinhibition in order to act. If my substantia nigra is damaged, okay, I have insufficient dopamine, okay, to drive this di disinhibition. And so motor execution becomes quite difficult. Motor initiation and, init and, and sustaining a motor command becomes very, very difficult, okay? That's the key thing about Parkinson's, okay? Now, uh, give you another image and then I'm gonna do Huntington's and then the cerebellum and that's it. All right, again, now these are um, more images now this time, not so cartoonish, and I want you to understand how to read sort of this type of an MR image, okay? Now, um, all you have to do, it gave you kind of an arrow to mark where the substantia nigra is in this MRI image. So now we have a healthy control adult here, okay? You can be looking at the SN about here. I lost my uh, highlighter pointer after my crash. Um, and then here, look at a Parkinson's patient and their SN here, okay? And you see this significant um, dropout um, in signal. Um, so it actually reflects a significant drop in tissue volume here in the Parkinson's patient, okay? And so again, this is the reason why it's a lack of dopamine generation problem. Um, and so it should be no surprise to you then um, that one of the things um, in terms of pharmaceuticals that, um, that, that a Parkinson's patient might be given to help relieve some of their motoric problems is something that might promote uh, the presence of dopamine in their nervous system. Okay, so there are uh, something specific, uh, so, so you guys might not have heard of it, but there are um, dopamine precursors, L-DOPA, that we could um, provide these patients with that would sort of enhance the dopamine content there. So this is the Parkinson's problem. Oops. The second problem, Huntington's, is what you guys might actually have thought was Parkinson's. This is the excessive movement problem, okay? This one is a genetics, um, heavily genetics problem. Okay, so Huntington's here is characterized by a lot of abnormal movements, um, very often accompanied by, I wrote here, dementia and uh, personality and mood disorders as well. Um, and the reason is actually um, due to where the degeneration happens in a Huntington's patients. You see, actually, it's a lot of um, degeneration here, specifically in the basal ganglia. Of course, you're going to say, oh, well, Parkinson's was a degeneration as well, but it was specifically in the substantia nigra. Um, but also sometimes in the midbrain as well. But here, okay, because the basal ganglia, in addition to serving your movement loop back to cortex, is also actually serving a lot of a lot of cognitive functions, including memory functions. So if we have a rather broad gray matter loss in the basal ganglia, it should be no surprise that in addition to movement problems, we're going to also have these other cognitive. Um, and uh, uh, so dementia-like problems and uh, memory and mood issues as well. All right, so I'll show you here this time um, and then we'll get to the words in a second. Um, Tourette's, so, so, so the question here, sorry, YouTube. I hope you guys are still, hope you guys are still commanded. Yeah, so that's not connected. Yes, yeah, Sumed says, um, is Tourette syndrome also related to um, uh, dysfunction in the basal ganglia? You know what? In fact, this one has some. Um, so, so I'm not sure if you guys over over on uh, the other side are actually hearing me because I'm seeing like everyone drop out there. Yeah, I'm not sure. 
Tourette's, um, what I understand is actually um, more than the basal ganglia. It does involve the basal ganglia, but I think it's the entire loop of the cortical striatal um, uh, um, thalamo back to cortex pathway. So um, I, I have to look into it though specifically, but it's not isolated to the basal ganglia as I understand the, the Tourette's to be. Okay, Justin says you guys are working. Okay, I don't know. Yeah, because my, my, my side um, had you guys frozen, but I think Zoom is fine. Um, great. So Huntington's, right. Have a look here. Again, extensive destruction of the uh, basal ganglia. And you can see that's why compared to the healthy control, okay, you can see why the ventricles look particularly enlarged um, here because there's quite a lar large loss of neurons here around uh, the basal ganglia structures. Okay. And um, um, here, remember I said Huntington's is different par from Parkinson's because it's characterized by excessive movement. Now let's try to understand this. What's happening here, okay, remember the globus pallidus, which is where I started with the flailing animated GIF, right? That is the thing, okay, that is severely damaged in, uh, um, in uh, Huntington's. And that means that there is a decreased inhibition Remember that tonic inhibition that the GP provides to the thalamus in order to keep all your motor programs in check. Okay, in this particular case in Huntington's, that, that tonic inhibition gets destroyed. And so in this case, this is what we're talking about if you're thinking about a loss of control of movement um, resulting in this you know, excessive flailing. I hate to call it flailing, but you know, unintended, um, excessive movement that is Huntington's and that is specifically because of your um, loss of tonic inhibition and that is exactly why it was important although I know it was a little bit tedious for you to learn so much so quickly it's been very important for you to understand how ultimately actions get released actions don't get stimulated actions get released from their tonic inhibition and I think when you think of it in the context of what happens in Parkinson's um, when you have the lack of dopamine and therefore, um, you know, the lack of um, uh, the ability to um, disinhibit, right? Um, in the case of Huntington's, you have a severe degradation of the globus pallidus and therefore you have um, in, in, an ability to have this tonic control the tonic inhibition of your motor patterns and when you think of it in the context of these two diseases I think everything becomes a little bit more clear as to why the basal ganglia are uh, very key to your motor loop although as I said they also play key roles um, in um, your 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 other aspects of cognition and memory so 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 that's why I insisted on kind of throwing that into your lecture today more MRI images I'm almost done my lecture um, and so again you see the enlarged ventricles in a patient with uh, Huntington's disease uh, because of the degradation of the basal ganglia again look at this your control has a healthy caudate healthy putamen these are some of the terms I throw at you when I introduce all the subparts of the basal ganglia. Imagine now, in addition to that, of course, you have the, the GP over here, which is the inferior part um, after the pyramid. That's also destroyed. Um, and so then, as a consequence, you look at this kind of rather enlarged ventricle in the case of the Huntington's. And because of all that, because of the very key role of the globus pallidus in maintaining that tonic inhibition, you get that excessive a uh, rhythm motion pattern in um, your in your um, Huntington's disease patients. I had originally a couple of short clips um, that that I wanted to play, but I'm gonna run out of time. Um, but what I'll do is like I'll send um, like I think I was talking with Alden, so I sent, I'll send her the links so that it can get forwarded on because I don't think I have the TA's emails or one of you guys can email me after that. One missing piece that I didn't teach in your LOs, but is thankfully rather simple, is of course the cerebellum, right? And this is my sole slide for the cerebellum because everyone wants to go home now. Um, the cerebellum, um, it's really funny because in Chinese, so so I was so I was educated in Canada and I learned all my stuff in in English. Um, now I learned the cerebellum in Chinese is called the small brain. Is that is that how we understand it in English too? <laughs> so it's this kind of really complex, very highly um, kind of strided substructure of your brain. We've all heard about how the cerebellum is important. I want to fill in why it's important just very, very briefly here. 
in the context of motor coordination. I think what we haven't quite talked about. I talked about how you know we could have the motor planning from the cortex and the tactic planning and then everything gets sent to the spinal cord. Eventually spinal cord sends uh, nerves out to the muscles. But what we, and we talked about stuff, great, thanks, Suman. Um, what we haven't talked about is there's, there's gotta be other checks installed into our central nervous system in order for us to keep ourselves coordinated, right? Although, yeah, the cortex plays a good role in planning and stuff, but at some point, you know, we need to be able to coordinate all these different uh, motor programs as well. And that's where the cerebellum um, plays a role in. I, I just gave you the text here. Um, uh, adjust timing sequencing of different muscle contractions, um, um, you know, sorting out these multi-joint movements, how, how they should be executed, what should be stimulated in what order. That's what the cerebellum is key for. And it's interesting because we learned a great deal from patients with lesions in these key structures, right? Just like we learned a great deal from checking out what happens in the Parkinson's patients with severe SN degradation, in Huntington's patients with severe uh, globus pallidus degradation, if we look at patients with cerebellar lesions, okay, what we find are very uncoordinated actions, very inaccurate uh, movements as well because they don't benefit from this timing and sequencing uh, ability. And I'm just going to, I think I have a image and then again, um, MRI image here where we circle a healthy cerebellum and an unhealthy cerebellum and you can see here okay the healthy one is pretty you know full lots of gray matter lots of white matter um, and you contrast that with just like the sheer content that you see in the same brain on the left side okay and you can see how um, you know visually you can already see the, the difference between the two and so on the left hand side, this individual would uh, likely be, at least compared to the individual on the right hand side, this individual would um, be much more likely to be uncoordinated um, and uh, inaccurate in terms of their final uh, motor execution. All right, and so I'm going to conclude with a summary. I, I think I don't traditionally include the words in my summary when I send out my slides. Um, and so here are, here's my summary. And I think, you know, firstly, I get it, you know, a lot of terms and I, but I, but I hope the general gist of the story you have been able to capture um, today, okay? So motor control involves just about everything, right? And um, it involves certainly what you classically think, the cortex, the brain, okay? The, the gray matter stuff. And I've, we went through the key patches of the cortex that are relevant here. Um, area four, area six, right? Area four um, for finally the selection um, and um, the, the tactic making, but then it also includes other cortical areas beyond four and six um, that feed in, right? Parietal frontal cortex feeding in, for example, my, my uh, spatial coordinates uh, and integrating other data from other sensory uh, cortices. But the thing is always remember the chicken. <laughs> okay, the brain is just half the story, okay? That stuff needs to reach the spinal cord because ultimately the contraction, okay, of your muscles, okay, um, is commanded by your spinal cord, okay? And, um, and, and so we talked about, again, the distinction between um, the, the various nerves that exit the different spinal columns, right? And, and the key difference there was that depending on where they exit, they serve muscles of different parts of our body. That was a simple story there. We talked a little bit about the neuromuscular junction, right? Because eventually, gosh, my nerve fiber coming out of spinal cord needs to talk to the, the muscles, right? And the way, like the rest of the nervous system, the way we talk to other cells is by sending via these uh, biochemical, you know, pouches, right? These neurotransmitter proteins. Um, releasing it from the first cell to the second cell and then to the third cell, right? From the second to the third, from the third to the fourth, like this, right? So the principles of synaptic transmission are very much the same across all sensory and motor systems. Just what's different is that I'm working with acetylcholine. I'm working with acetylcholine uh, receptors um, at the level of the muscle fibers. 
in between, I added twists to you that weren't quite in your learning objectives, but I think are equally as important. We spent a little bit of time in the second half talking about the basal ganglia, the subcortical nuclei, okay, that you learned are key to prevent yourself from being that animated GIF, right? Because the motor, motor system doesn't work in terms of initiating by, you know, just let's now orderly excite everything and excite my arm muscle, okay? Motor system is better thought of as something that is tonically inhibited, all your motor programs, and that when I need something, I selectively disinhibit, okay? And so we learned all these things, and we learned about the relationship, uh, and we learned about the logic of why Parkinson's is like Parkinson's, and why Huntington's results in this excessive movement pattern, okay? And then, then finally, um, we talked about how cerebellum uh, in that one slide, I hate not to do it justice, but we just don't have time, um, is key for keeping everything coordinated, all the muscles in what order, um, you know, so, so that's key as well, okay? Um, and so then my final kind of thing was, remember I was talking about, um, obviously we have, uh, remember that from the brain to down to your spinal columns, um, we're traveling down these spinal tracks and we had these major, two major clusters, right? We had the voluntary control lateral tracks, which in the human we've got redundancy in. And then we've got the ventromedial tracks, which serves our kind of reflexive postural control. Okay, so uh, hopefully, so that's all I have to, for today. Brought right to six o'clock Hong Kong time. Um, I apologize for the earlier um, crash. It was honestly hard crash. Uh, part of that I think is probably like I hear the server going behind me and I, I, I'm gonna blame it on the guys in my lab who sabotaged us <laughs> um, I, I would like let me I'd like to anything. thank professor uh, Dorita for delivering this amazing lecture thank you so much and it was it was uh, you kept the enthusiasm high and I think that that energized everyone and we were all listening throughout the field and and it was really a great talk and you, you, you managed to uh, you know put in so much of information and and yet you deliver everything like uh, give a broad overview of the entire uh, topic and, and I, I believe amazing job. Thank Thanks, you so Sasha. much. For that Thanks. Work. Yeah. Uh, would you uh, would you be uh, would you have do you have time to take some uh, questions? Yeah, or I do. I just, I'm going to turn you guys up because um, you know technical problems abound. Um, Okay, if there's any question uh, we have uh, for Professor Dorita, please uh, raise your hand and, uh, or, or just unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, if you raise your hand, I'm not going to see it, but the tutors will flag you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, Professor, I have one question. Uh, so. Uh, there are, uh, so uh, you spoke, spoke about the uh, lat lateral uh, tracks that were going, and so uh, there was this, uh, the cerebellar, uh, 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 yeah, the one one that is going from the cortical region is thicker than the one that's going from yeah. between the rubrospinal tract. Yeah, this so, one. Uh, so, uh, so, the, the, um, so I, uh, I mean, uh, Kyla and uh, I were having a discussion on that. So yeah. she, she was, uh, she raised up a question that why, why is why does it need to be uh, thicker? What could be the reason why it's thicker than the uh, root of spinal tract? Uh, yeah. So what could be the reason? I think we, we mentioned this a little bit. I think this was like, was this right before my crash or right after my crash? Um, I think one of the, uh, it is truly thicker. Um, and uh, one of the things that I brought up um, was like the rest of the CNS, that the thicker gives us a uh, more reliable transmission um, and a faster right. transmission as well right. Yeah. Right. so I think um, from that perspective so why like I mean in this case we are yeah. a little bit this is an evolutionary question I like to believe that humans because of the increasingly complex behavior requirements that we have to do right um, that we have then gradually evolved kind of a more efficient so I mentioned out of these two lateral tracks that one of them um, was newer, right? This cortical spinal right, right, is newer. Right, right. And so it, from an evolutionary perspective, it makes a lot of sense for us to sort of look at the rubrospinal tract and say, you're okay, but we can do better. 
Um, and so it feels like um, it feels like over history, um, humans gradually evolved this larger tract to both um, be able to serve and integrate all these different cortical functions. Again, we talked about how we've got cortex, but you know the lower mammalians don't. So on the one hand, we get direct cortical input by developing this new tract over evolutionary history. On the other hand, we get faster transmission and more reliable transmission by developing the secondary tract as well. So, you know, it, it could be, you know, I, and I'm sure, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, um, that could already be enough reason for us to have developed these things. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, certainly, we didn't develop it as a fail safe, right? I think I think we shouldn't think think of it like this. Although I did present it as well, it's nice because we've still got the rubro, right? And it's yeah. interesting. It's a little bit curious because, um, to my knowledge, although someone can kind of prove me wrong. Um, again, I'm a vision person, but to my knowledge, the rubro spinal tract doesn't give us anything in addition um that the cortical spinal one doesn't do so the question is why did we preserve it and i think that's a very interesting question to have yeah so is it is it like uh you know uh to keep sure uh, to make sure that you know there are multiple checks uh, midbrain from the uh, the uh, spinal tract being preserved sorry i couldn't quite make it out is it to make sure huh. I'm saying, is it to make sure that, that there are multiple checks? And uh, so there's this uh, one check in the lower level and there's this other uh, other uh, uh, bigger check in the higher levels. Is it, is it, could it be something like that? So, so in the uh, normal healthy human, although I'm yeah. saying the rubrospinal tract doesn't give us anything in addition um, that is unique to it, that the cortical spinal tract does, uh, gives us already, um, in the normal human both tracks actually still function um and so um is it is it so that it gives us a fail safe again like i i sort of doubt that's why we evolved it um but yeah i i'm not sure how to like honestly i'm not sure how to speculate on why we we have it um because certainly uh, certainly if we were talking about the development of the human nervous system it's slightly it doesn't Quite make a lot of sense for us to develop a secondary pathway that we don't quite need, right? In in terms of evolutionary um, history, we usually develop and prune things that are quite specific to to what the human needs. Thank I guess you. what I'm uh, trying to say is redundancy isn't usually built into the CNS. Okay, okay. And uh, do we do we have an idea of what happens if the if specifically the uh, rubus spinal tract gets damaged and 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 the uh, uh, and the cortico spinal tract? That. So uh, uh, I, I just lost you at the end there. So is the question, what happens if the rubrospinal tract is damaged, but not the corticospinal one, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah in yeah. that case, then you're fine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I don't see, uh, I think you were, I think you were very good with the lecture. So you made sure that all the questions are answered. So I don't see any hands here or anyone on the so I don't think there are too many questions they have. Okay, I great. I yeah, I don't see anything on YouTube side, but that's because I think they all went to dinner already. Um, so <laughs> uh, um, well, uh, yeah. one, uh, Sumit has this question on, on the chat, if you, if you can see. Uh, oh, the, the stratum is inhibited. inhibited when GP relax, uh, releases an action to the thalamus was. Oh, I see. Um, okay, so I'm going to bring back the... So I did... I apologize for skipping. Like, I lost a few minutes because of... <laughs> because of the crash but here it is actually um okay so not exactly so the order is a little bit different is, is sumid um so when we want to release an action what's actually happening is the striatum gets excited and when we excite the striatum the striatum then will inhibit the gp and inhibiting the gp is the only way we can disinhibit the thalamus like this uh, whereas it is not inhibited when the GP is inhibited. What could, yeah. I don't know if that, that helps you, Sumi. So yeah, a little bit a little bit backwards in logic there. Um, so it's the, ex the excitation of the striatum needs to happen um, in order for us to inhibit the GP in order for us to disinhibit motion. Now, let's tie this back to, 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 to the dopamine problem in Parkinson's again. Remember when I said Parkin uh, Parkinson's patients the lack of the dopamine is the reason why they can't 
release action very well. And that's why you get this rigidity. Um, in fact, that this is exactly what dopamine is exciting. Dopamine is responsible for exciting the striatum in order to start this whole chain of disinhibition. Okay, that's how it ties together. So hopefully that, that helps you with that question. Yeah, I think that answers it. Perfect. Great. Yeah. Great, Sumi. Yeah, it's, you know what, I think it's, um, I think the motor system is cute. I think it doesn't get enough attention. Um, and there's so many little things, um, you know, that, that is so curious about it. Because, you know, if you were to walk in and you were to ask a student, I think you would always think, you wouldn't think about this animated GIF, right? That's not how we would think, you know, it should work. Um, so, in fact, it's really cute that, you know, we got to keep ourselves tonically chill. <laughs> and we got to dis disinhibit yeah. our... Program. And I think ev ev everything that we do, humans, are, is all about movement. Like yeah. Talking, you know, <laughs> anything. It's all, 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 all about motion. So, so, yeah. so what yeah. I'd like you guys to remember, there's a lot of details a bit today, but remember, of course, the motor system, like all the other systems of the CNS, don't operate in isolation, right? So always remember, at the same time, of course, it needs to integrate um, information from the other senses. Of course, it needs to integrate information from, you know, proprioception about my current body position, right? So there's there's quite a bit. There's a quite a bit to integrate, um, and and that's why we need that, you know, the the cortex back to the spinal cord, back to the cortex, back to the spinal cord. We need all these loops all the time because we need to keep ourselves um, updated. Do I keep stretching? Do I, you know, you know, do I contract? What is the current status of my body? Um, and so it's it's very important. Like it's it's when I teach other sensory systems, it's the same thing. Um, it's very important to remember that system doesn't work in isolation. Um, but it is still rather cute when we look at it in isolation. Okay, we have a couple things here. Um, we have a question here from Jesse, and Jesse says. What weakens Broca's area, and if it gets weakened, does it affect Wernicke's area? Are you guys actually, did you guys have a lecture on uh, Broca's and Wernicke's? I'm not sure if I can, I'm going to try to find a picture here um, to help we, us. We had, a, we had a talk on the uh, sensory uh, systems, uh, so yeah, a little on that. We, we, uh, the last lecture. Yeah, so I'm just going to um, answer this question by giving you a Google image <laughs> because because it's very hard to talk about the errors with an image. Oh God, these images are these images are terrible on. Uh... Oh my God, never Google images for your classes. Um... So okay, what weakens it? Well, a lesion, quite honestly. Uh, regularly, it shouldn't be weakened. Um, so for those of you not familiar, I think I just downloaded this picture here. There we go. Okay, it's honestly just literally from the internet, but for those of you not familiar with where they are, okay? These are, are your uh, two of your key um, language areas, right? Um, I don't think, I can't find a, I, I don't think I can find a better picture here. So anyway, two key areas um, I didn't talk about because they're not really, you know, of course it's a motor um, thing, but it's more of a language. These two are more two language structures. I think you could have a whole lecture on language, but the general lowdown is that the Broca's area is more related to production, right? And the Wernicke's is um, for language understanding. And so um, in terms of the question of um, what would get it weakened, so for example, a lesion. So, um, like not to totally confuse you, but um, in my lab, again, we do the visual system, but sometimes we um, are privileged enough to work with some um, patient cases um, with vision damage, but also because they've had a stroke with more than vision damage. So other lesions to specific parts of the brain, including, curiously, um, uh, sometimes specifically just the Broca's region or specifically just the Wernicke's region. So um, quite, um, quite in alignment with your textbook, let's say, if we find in the patient that we get matter loss or lesions in the Broca's area, then, then we do find that this patient really does have impaired speech. Um, and if in the Wernicke's, you have these other patient cases with selective Wernicke's damage, and while they can produce utterances, right, you get rather um, impaired ability to understand. Uh, understand language. So it's very difficult for me to sort of answer the question of what, what produces 
um, a week in Broca's or Wernicke's. Like to my knowledge, I, I I'm not entirely sure if 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 there are if there could be any um, neurodegenerative reasons. Um, the most common reasons I see are lesion regions, um, stroke regions, um, due to like hypoxic damage. Um, so yeah, Jesse, that's the extent to which I can answer your question there. Um, George, if the GP inhibits actions and releases one from some kind of pool, what are these? Oh, sorry, I didn't scroll down. <clears throat> where are these different possible actions generated? Um, where are these possible different actions generated in the first place? Um, I think to think about um, this, um, in fact, we can talk about the chicken again. <laughs> I, I hate to always go back to the stupid chicken, but it's a great teaching tool because you guys haven't actually asked me why the chicken will still keep flopping in a coordinated manner, even without its head. Um, although I said, because your spinal cord um, or the brainstem, which might be preserved in your chicken, will still uh, still be able to send commands. Okay, so you can think of it as, um, I think it's one of these controversial things in, 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 in motor neuroscience where we believe, in fact, the motor system doesn't work in terms of um, really initiating and selecting specific fine, um, how do I say, like when I want to trigger a like arm, arm contraction, I don't necessarily have to systematically trigger um, you know, upper muscle, upper arm muscle, then this muscle, then this muscle, then this muscle, like this. What the current thinking is, we actually, and, and you might have heard me use the term motor programs. What the current thinking is, we actually have inbuilt motor programs. Um, and um, all it takes, and the reason why we have extensive cortical overlap, for example, from my fingers to my shoulder, is that they all belong usually to the same motor program. The, the same, you know, usually all of these belong to the same motor, motor command and motor output. And so um, the way to think about it is um, um, we have a repertoire of not so much individual muscle movement instructions, but we have a repertoire of motor command uh, motor motor programs <laughs> that's so hard to explain we have a um i don't know what, what what a good analogy is um um it's much like stretching and flexing your arm is a is a is a hierarchical problem of a subseries of independent motor commands in fact the unit that we work with is usually the unit that we store things in in the the motor system and it's not so much these individual muscles uh, and muscle instructions but we, we we kind of have these inbuilt patterns uh, program patterns motor program patterns um, and and that this is actually what we are uh, releasing um, when we execute an action Not sure at all if that helped you answer your question. Great. It's so hard for it because I, I was going to think of a vision analogy, but I couldn't really. Well, maybe I could. It's like much like in the visual system, you know, you've heard that we store, you know, we, we have specific neurons to look at lines and uh, at different orientations. But when we get very higher up in cortex, further, um, we have further neurons that in code for patterns of lines that make a face, patterns of lines that you know make various objects. It's sort of similar in the motor system. We encode motor patterns. Great. I think that's a very good answer. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, wait, wait. May, may I also ask you a question? Yeah, I don't know. I'm really are. sorry. I'm really sorry for delaying your dinner time because it's also six to like past six here but um may i first ask like how because in parkinson's right you'd inhibit the motor control then how do the tremors come about okay so um very good question the tremors actually come from a degeneration in the midbrain <laughs> so I, I i deliberately left it out i deliberately left it out because it's not the 
Although it's visually for you guys, the hallmark of what you see in Parkinson's, it doesn't translate into degeneratively the hallmark of what is happening in terms of the neuroscience of Parkinson's. So the tremor specifically, let's address that. Um, so it's actually due to, um, we currently think, um, it's due to um, degeneration of um, a specific uh, part of the midbrain that then leads to very similar thing that you saw in Huntington's, it leads to an inhibition problem. Okay, so that's, that's why the tremors. So, so if I had taught you that, I felt like you wouldn't be able to grasp the, like the key distinction between Huntington's and Parkinson's. But yeah, that's a very, very good question. The unfortunate part about Parkinson's. So, the, so, so the, again, let's not get too confused. The, the, the key thing about Parkinson's is the inability for the dopamine neurons to, like we just had in that first question, um, to, where's my, where's my, where's my, where's my formula slide? Yeah, to excite the striatum in order to release action. That's the key problem in Parkinson's. But at the same time, we do have Parkinson's patients. I don't know if you're aware, not all Parkinson's patients have tremors, okay? But we do have some who have tremors, a lot who have tremors, and they, those tremors aren't because of this, but because of a secondary midbrain problem. Oh, all right. Yeah. Uh, may I also ask about motion perception? Motion perception. So we're we talking about vision. Yep. Uh, sure, do you know about away. the <laughs> Do you know about the spinning dancer illusion? Hmm. Yes, I do. In fact, um, I don't know if you've read. Did you read that from a news article? Uh, not really. Like, it's it's a kind of a meme thing. Oh. Like a couple of years ago. But uh, because I'm a psychology student currently, but right. that doesn't really address how the how the illusion comes about. So I'd like to ask you here. Okay. Um, so all those only interested in the motor system can leave. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so going sorry. To see if I can find um, find a picture because I think a lot of people do. You have a link to the the illusion. Maybe you can show show the rest of your classmates. Do I have a link? I think it needs to be a GIF. GIF? GIF? Or, or, yeah, or like a, yeah, I guess it needs to be a GIF. Let's see. We... I'm so scared about what Google provides us with. <laughs> Spinning dancer. So the illusion is quite simple. Actually, it's not new though. It's quite old. Are, are you guys aware of this? Um, the, oh, well, okay, this will do. It's a stupid YouTube video. Oh my God. <laughs> okay, well, maybe you, you can explain. Okay, I was gonna say, maybe you can explain to your classmates what the premise of this illusion is. But it's on the text here. <laughs> uh, uh, here, have a look. Well, to me, it's spinning anti-clockwise. Do we have classmates who see it spinning another way? Okay, so we get clockwise and we get counterclockwise. Okay. So are you asking about the science behind this? Uh, yes. Yeah, you have to take my second year class. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, so, in it, so, so you're asking basically how it relates to motion perception, right? Because I, I think you probably had a lecture on that, did you? Um, on um, how we see motion. And um, like, obviously I'm not going to reteach um, whatever you guys learned, whatever you guys learned. Um, what I want to say is actually this is not just a motion problem. This is a curious vision problem. And the way you want to understand this is when we look at, okay, look, the, 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 the way we like to understand the, uh, the, the brain is that we take sensory data and then we make a conclusion that is totally objective and totally about the sensory data. And what I want to tell you is that in fact, we, bring a lot of our own uh, 
you've probably heard this term as a psychology student, top down information to your sensory data in order to yeah, fill yeah, yeah. in holes and in order to fill in assumptions. And the reason why some of you see it clockwise and some of you see it counterclockwise is because of some of you assuming that you are viewing this ballerina from above and some of you assuming that you are viewing the ballerina from below. Um, and in fact, there are other visual illusions that have the same, uh, the same consequence. Um, you, you might have seen a rotating Necker cube. That's another example. So try when you're looking at this, again, it's not a very long YouTube video, but try to force yourself to change your assumption about your viewpoint. And then you should be able to get her to rotate in a different direction. It's hard to get yourself to change your assumption. <laughs> that's that's this is the only this is the only problem. I focus on her static leg, I guess. I don't know, and it kind of worked. Yeah, like, but but this is this is the if if we might good is I, 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 sorry I don't know how to pr uh, pronounce your name, but good exactly that's it. So so this is this is one of the key reasons why um, we we have these illusions among m many other um, visual illusions as well. I can't find it on the internet right now, but you can see um, if you like try to search for the rotating Necker cube, it's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same thing. Um, you will um, you will you will uh, perceive that Necker cube to be rotating clockwise or counterclockwise depending on what you brought into that situation. Um, yeah, I do. I do kind of illusions extensively in my perception class, and uh, the other one I'm going to send you home with, although I won't address for you in class. You can email me if you can't figure it out. Is um, back a good five years now. There was the uh, blue black dress, white gold dress problem. Oh my God, are you talking about color constancy? Uh, yes, I'm. But that's the same premise, isn't it? Because you're seeing um, your neighbor is seeing white gold, you're seeing black blue based on the same physical sensory data generated by that photo, right? What's different um, are you guys uh, different, you guys, you guys have different assumptions about the lighting of that scene. And that is what is driving um, some of you to be so adamant it is white and gold and some of you to be so adamant that it is uh, uh, black and blue. So I suggest you guys, uh, go home and Google that illusion as well. Um, but it's, it's the same thing. So I think one of the mysteries then um, is about, uh, you know, I think I like to say, you know, the sensory data all the time, I hammer this home in my second year class, the sensory data is, is definitely not the, um, the only thing that drives what you see. And very, very often, um, you know, our percept is um, um, kind of altered by what we individually bring in. Um, and unfortunately, we often, there are many things that we can't control either, you know. In, in the ballerina case, I've suggested to you that you try to force yourself to have a different viewpoint. But many of the assumptions that we apply are automatic assumptions as well um, that we can't actually actively change. So it's a very curious thing, the brain. Yeah, I think you have explained things very clearly in Good. this case. Uh, may I ask one more question? I don't know, I think your classmates <laughs> are dying, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm really sorry, but I want to ask about motor neurons, like mot mirror motor neurons. I see. I mean... This is a true psychology student you have in your uh, class. Uh, <laughs> pardon, pardon. <laughs> yes, I'm mirror sorry. neurons. Yes. So in mirror neurons, I, I was just thinking, because mirror neurons are those neurons that they get activated when you're performing an action, as well as when you're observing that particular action, Correct. right? But... Uh, for observing, that would be a sensory aspect of, of the whole phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Then how do those neurons actually get activated? Um, so, so, you know, actually, let me bring back the, the slide. Uh, for those of you, you know, in my regular class, um, this actually is actually taught, but I took it out because obviously there's just so much here. Where your, where your classmate is talking about in terms of mirror neurons, they're actually dominantly located in the primate brain in this part of area six, in the PMA uh, premotor area. And what she's talking about there is that we've got these neurons that simultaneously um, will respond um, to um, when I observe someone doing a particular action pattern, okay? And also when I my, myself um, am doing that action. And when I, when I was starting my lecture, I was saying motor system is very interesting to vision scientists. And I was saying because um, they do share some things, this is one of the things they share. And so the question there is, 
um, how does it get activated, um, right? From like, like if it's purely non, like if I'm just observing that action, but um, but um, um, I'm not doing the action myself, and it is clearly in an area that we consider consider motoric. How on earth? Why on earth? Right? Would would it um, be active? I don't want you to think about it in terms of oh v1 act was active and then motion area and uh, v5 was active and then eventually finally went to uh, pm pma and your mirror neurons i want you to think about it like this um for some reason okay um um we we have again this this idea of having an evolutionarily built system to make us sensitive to actions um and pma is one of these areas much like if you want it, you've probably heard of other areas around cortex that have these weird specializations, right? We have like the face area, right? And um, um, in fact, we can have a car area if you're our car expert as well. So mm. we have an action specialization area. I think that's what you want to think PMA to be. And, and this cluster of mirror neurons, they're action specialized neurons. And this set of action specialized neurons doesn't really care about whether this action is triggered by visual stimulation or this action is triggered by your motoric system. The fact that you are executing this action pattern is enough um, to engage this particular area. And um, one of the key, so it's puzzling because, well, okay, given we have the visual system on its own and we have the motor system on its own and blah, blah, why do we need this special shared interface? Um, and, um, you know, some people like to argue it is so that we can have a more efficient area um, for us to, to recognize um, other people doing those actions. Um, and so I, I don't know how much you've read in terms of this area of the literature, but it has gone, like at some point 10 years ago, I turned off my literature reading switch on the mirror neurons because it got a little bit out of hand because they believed, oh, we have this fantastic shared action area for action observation and action execution. It must be the area that is malfunctioning when we have social deficits. You know, oh, I so, about so there's a lot of this stuff that gets kind of stretched. And I think rather, okay, I think we can all agree it is nice to have a specialized neural center for action rec recognition and action understanding um, so that you can tap into your action expertise uh, repertoire um, in, order, in order to understand others. So I think it's not so much um, a we don't have the mirror neurons to facilitate our execution of actions. We have the mirror neurons to facilitate our recognition of actions. So to recognize different actions, the mirror neuron system is there. Yeah. All right. Does that give us an urge to imitate actions though? Um, I, so, so I'm not sure if um, it gives you an urge. Does it facilitate? Yes. Oh, all right, yeah. all right. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much. I'm sorry for delaying the the dinner. No problem. Okay. So, any other motor specific questions? If not, then I will let you go. And I will, um, before I go off, I'll make sure I send your tutor the links to the videos I didn't show, um, so you can check out like a little bit about the Parkinson's and the Huntington stuff. Um, aside from that, guys, take care. Obviously, it's a uh, very bizarre time in the world um but hopefully you guys you know find ways to still still get yourself interested in your studies and uh, get yourself interested in in the brain i think it's a very cool thing to be studying thank you mom great thanks guys all right i'm gonna head off then thank you hearing your lecture Thanks, guys. And, uh, and the chat is filling with a lot of, a lot of thank you. Everybody is thanking you right now. Yeah, <laughs> I, I see that. Oh, okay, yeah. great. I was just, I was just looking for the TA's email there. Uh, okay, I got it. I got it. Thanks, guys. Take care. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. So. Yeah,